Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. Hey, little skeletons, I'm Gina. And I'm Amber. And this is Weird True Crime. are back with part three of the utterly senseless murder of Gannon Stouk by his evil step monster, Letitia Stouk. Now, if you're jumping into this case now, we highly recommend listening to parts one and two to better understand this very convoluted and ridiculous case. Small recap. Letitia Stout got caught in multiple lies about what happened to Gannon on January 27th, 2020. Some of these lies included being raped by two different men, Gannon being kidnapped, and trying to get a fake polygraph test in a last-ditch effort to prove her innocence. Honestly, that barely scratches the surface of what this woman said and did. Let's not forget about attacking an officer with a monster energy drink in an attempt to escape and claiming to receive threats in her peanut butter in prison. It's hard to imagine the details getting any more insane than they already are, but alas, they do. We can't put it off any longer, so strap in because it's time to break down what happens during the trial and finally be done with this awful woman. During the first week of the trial, the witnesses included Al Stouk, Letitia's now ex-husband, good for you, buddy, Mm -hmm. and experts that spoke more about the olive green suitcase found with Gannon's body inside. Police who initially responded to the call about Gannon's disappearance were questioned about Letitia's mental state on that day and in the following weeks. They all stated she didn't act like most parents would when their child goes missing. A neighbor of the Stouks was called to testify and told the jury that Letitia blocked her on Facebook after the neighbor questioned her about where they should be looking for Gannon. That's a legitimate and completely reasonable question. Right. And if you cared, wouldn't you want to answer or be out there looking? Do everything you can to bring your child home. Prosecution also called the front desk worker for the Candlewood Suites in Pensacola, Florida, where Letitia and Harley checked in on February 4th, 2020. During week two of the trial, the jury heard testimony from a former neighbor of the family. Letitia tried to bribe the neighbor with money so she would tell police that she saw Gandon get into a car. Letitia said she didn't do anything wrong. She just needed the information to get out there so police would start looking in other locations. The neighbor then contacted authorities and turned over her phone to investigators. What the fuck, Letitia? The medical examiner who performed Gannon's autopsy was called to testify regarding the injuries he sustained. In total, Gannon had 18 stab wounds to his body, four blunt force injuries to his skull that resulted in skull fractures, and one gunshot wound under his chin. All of the injuries were sustained prior to death. Notably, the doctor was not able to see any burns on Gannon's arms due to the level of decomposition. A small amount of the drug hydrocodone was also found in Gannon's system. Al testified that they did have some hydrocodone in the home due to a previous woodworking injury, but he and Letitia were the only people who knew where the medication was located. The theory here is that Letitia gave Gannon hydrocodone in an attempt to subdue him and make it easier to complete her plan. 
It's during week two of the trial that the recordings from Letitia's customer service calls to fakepolygraph.com are played. She is obviously trying to hide her face in her hands at the defense table while the recordings are played. The fact that she tried to cover her tracks with a fake polygraph shows she was more than aware of what she had done and was now trying to scramble to prove her innocence. Spencer Wilson, the reporter who interviewed Letitia in the now infamous news report, took the stand to discuss her behavior during the interview. He stated that he talked to neighbors who had more concern for Gannon than she did. On Tuesday of week two, Letitia's half-brother, Dakota Lowry, took the stand. He didn't want to testify, but was subpoenaed, meaning he had no choice. As soon as he took the witness stand, he broke down in tears. Dakota testified that while they were helping Letitia move out of the home, he saw Letitia struggling to carry an olive green suitcase to the moving van. When he saw the suitcase, he felt like something was off. And when he asked Letitia what was in the suitcase, she told him it was softball stuff. He offered to help carry the suitcase for her, but she refused. When Dakota was shown a picture of the suitcase that Gannon was found in, he confirmed that it was the same suitcase he saw Letitia carrying. Jessica Bethel, the investigator that wrote the affidavit for Letitia's arrest, testified about the four-hour interview she conducted on January 29, 2020. This is the interview where Letitia showed up almost two hours late with a freshly washed car, a set of notes to read from, and the story about Eduardo attacking her and kidnapping Gannon. When trying to get Letitia to go to the hospital for a SANE exam, Letitia made every excuse she could think of for why she couldn't and she needed to go home. This is the point where she began stuffing tissues down her pants, saying she peed a little and that her pants were wet. Letitia also stated she was having chest pains due to feeling claustrophobic and having anxiety. By the time EMTs arrived for her exam, she was having extreme chest pains to the point where she couldn't answer basic questions. Look, it's totally viable that extreme anxiety and panic attacks can cause chest pains and make you feel like you're having a heart attack. As someone who has struggled with anxiety and panic attacks for like 25 years, I can speak to this being a legitimate symptom. However, with Letitia's propensity to lie and how all of this just suddenly came on once she knew she was being detained, it's really hard to believe her especially considering she was suddenly fine when she arrived at the hospital and snuck out in order to avoid investigators taking her DNA. She then went on to complain that she was held against her will without food or water when she was given a hot pocket and a soda while she was there. Detective Bethel also offered to contact someone who could bring Letitia her medication when she was complaining about her anxiety. The video shows a woman doing everything she can to be as difficult and non-compliant as possible. At the beginning of March, detectives found out she had fled to South Carolina and she was arrested. A small portion of the trip back to Colorado Springs was played for the jury, showing that attempt where Letitia slipped out of her handcuffs and attacked one of the detectives with a full closed monster energy drink can by hitting her in the face with it. This video is crazy. I highly recommend you watch it if you're interested in seeing like just how fast this woman switches. I mean, just full on like clocks this detective in the face with this can. The video shows her eyeing the detective's gun while trying to slip out of her cuffs. The car was moving down the highway at a speed of 75 miles an hour when this happened. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, and she goes on to say that she was trying, she was like hot. So she was trying to open the door on the other side of the detective while you're going 75 miles an hour 
down the road. Bitch, open the window. You, you, use your use your words like a, a grown up human person. Uh, God. Anyway, once Gannon's body had been found, her story changed even more, and she started speaking in different accents during interviews. Detective Bethel testified that Letitia showed no sign of mental illness. Well. But acted like a person doing everything they can to seem insane. An expert witness who was a senior firearms examiner testified that the bullet found in Gannon's body was shot by a Smith & Wesson 9mm handgun. The exact gun used was found on the dresser in the master bedroom of the Stauk residence. Week three of the trial was full of bombshell testimony, including Letitia's daughter Harley's account of events. It also came to the attention of the court that Letitia had been flipping off witnesses while they were on the stand. The judge told Letitia that if she continued, she would be removed from the courtroom and the trial would be continued without her. Letitia's face, while the judge is speaking to her, says it all. She looks annoyed that he's even acknowledging her and seems to roll her eyes when he chides her for her behavior. When Harley took the stand, she said she hadn't seen Letitia since the day she was arrested. She spoke about her close relationship with Gannon and how Al became like a father to her after her own father died in October of 2015. Letitia told Harley that her biological father died when someone broke into his house and killed him. A week before Harley testified, she found out that her father actually died from an overdose. Yet another lie in Letitia's arsenal. Which just makes you wonder how much Letitia had been lying to Harley her entire life about literally everything. Yep. Because telling a child their father died from like a burglary gone wrong is almost worse than just telling them that he died of an overdose. Like, I mean, there's I no good. There's no good way to tell your child that their parent is dead, but playing devil's advocate, an overdose paints him in a bad light where, yeah. you know, it wasn't his fault that he died. I can... But I'm not an advocate for lying about anything anyway. So no. just tell the fucking kid the truth. They're going to be devastated, but appreciate it, appreciate it more in the long run. Yeah. Just and how do you think you're going to feel cents. later in life when they find out that that's not what happened? Exactly. Mm. Harley testified about the candle incident and that Gannon didn't normally light candles or spend time in the basement alone. So the whole situation seemed very strange. Letitia's story about how the fire started changed multiple times, and she told Harley that Gannon was outside screaming about how much he hated his life. According to Harley, this wasn't like Gannon at all. The whole story comes across like Letitia is trying to paint a picture of Gannon being unstable and under mental duress. The testimonial made it sound like Letitia was trying to set the scene of an accident or make it sound like Gannon was going to take his own life. On the day of Gannon's disappearance, Harley returned home from work and Gannon wasn't home. Letitia said Gannon was at a friend's house and asked her to take Lena to the store to pick up the cleaning supplies mentioned in part one. When Harley got home, Gannon still wasn't home, which was very unusual because Gannon is very good with time and Letitia was strict about the kids being home at a particular time. After they all got in the car to see if Gannon was at his friend's house, Letitia sent Harley to look for Gannon while she stayed home. She also instructed Harley not to open the door for anyone on January 28th, the next day. For a large part of that day, Letitia was untrackable on the Life360 app and wouldn't tell Harley where she was, which again is extremely out of character. At one point, she even told Harley to leave Lena, Gannon's eight-year-old sister, at home alone. Harley refused to do this, and it's extremely strange that you'd already have one missing kid and then leave an eight-year-old at home alone unattended. If 
that were me, I would want to know where my kid was at all times. I wouldn't be leaving anyone alone. Harley testified that Letitia was acting extremely paranoid on the night of January 28th and asked Harley to pick her up from the hotel they were staying at around 10.30 p.m. Letitia left her Tiguan at the hotel. We know from the GPS data that Letitia drove to the remote area where Gannon's blood was found at around 9.30 p.m. that night. On the morning of January 29th, Harley drove Letitia back to the hotel to pick up the Tiguan and noted that she was still acting extremely paranoid and out of character. Harley told the prosecution that she didn't know where they were moving at the beginning of February and that Letitia kept giving her different locations. They stopped in Trinidad, Colorado, so Letitia could get a new phone. Letitia spent a lot of time on the phone talking to her sister about how she was being set up with Gannon's disappearance. Harley didn't question Letitia about where they were going or what was happening because Letitia was known to be aggressive and had previously backhanded her in the face for questioning her. Mm. This speaks volumes about Letitia's character and what kind of mother she was, just saying. Yeah. On February 3rd, the two stopped in Pensacola, Florida and stayed overnight at the Candlewood Suites. Harley said she was a very deep sleeper and wouldn't have known if Letitia had left at any point during the night or moved things around. She also testified she never went to the back of the van at any point during the trip because they had clothes in the front. Harley told the prosecution that Letitia seemed sad on the morning of February 4th, 2020. Letitia also said she was worried they were being followed, and this is when it was decided they would go to Myrtle Beach. Upon Letitia's arrest, Harley still believed her mother was innocent, but was forthcoming with the FBI about shopping for cleaning supplies and the information about Gannon's disappearance. Harley stopped believing Letitia when she found out about the insanity defense because Letitia never showed signs of having multiple personalities and was very competent when it came to making the hotel reservations and following the rules of the road during her attempt to flee. Harley got extremely emotional during cross-examination and said she felt manipulated when it came to Gannon's death and the lies about her own father's death. She was asked if she loved her mother, and her lack of an answer speaks volumes. During all of this, Letitia was sitting there completely unemotional. Harley's insights about Letitia's personality and need for everything to go her way at all times really painted a picture of the type of person Letitia is. We can only hope that Harley has a chance to live as normal of a life as possible, considering everything she's been through in her short 17 years. An investigator involved in the case testified that Letitia's behavior and changing stories in the days after Gannon's disappearance led them to focus more on her as a suspect and less on the possibility of a runaway child. All evidence and Letitia's behavior kept leading them back to the home. Though they were dealing with what is called a no-body crime, blood evidence in Gannon's room showed that something violent had occurred in the home, including the blood spatter on the walls and the seeping of blood through the carpet onto the concrete where Gannon's bed was located. The investigator testified that Letitia was not cooperating, nor was she acting as a parent normally would during a missing kid case. Her efforts to throw police off the right trail hindered their ability to investigate Gannon's whereabouts. Week three also included testimony from blood spatter experts and the description of what sort of instruments could have caused the stains found in the home. This is when we hear more about the findings of blood spatter from a gunshot wound, blunt force trauma, and trauma from a sharp object. We know from the autopsy that Gannon suffered from all three. The week wrapped up with more recordings from calls between Al and Letitia, where she continued to lie about what happened to Gannon and Quincy Brown's involvement. And just leave Quincy alone. 
Yeah, seriously, poor dude. When Al spoke to Letitia about Gannon's injuries, Letitia would only refer to Gannon as he or him. Investigators say this was Letitia's way of depersonalizing Gannon and separating herself from the situation. Overall, the week was filled with explosive testimony, more details about all of Letitia's lies, and hours upon hours of recorded phone calls and interrogations. There was even a new story concocted about a pregnant woman on the side of the road that Letitia and Gannon picked up on January 27th, 2020. I don't know. Once this woman got in the car, she pulled a gun on her. The woman made her go to Petco and told her she was going to help her with a money laundering scheme at a Mexican restaurant and then pulled out her fake belly full of money. <sighs> Where's my ibuprofen? <laughs> this story is absolutely ridiculous. And I'm sure everyone in the courtroom was tired of hearing these so-called accounts at this point. Letitia likes to pull her stories from the truth, though, and there was an article about a money laundering scheme taking place across 12 Mexican restaurants in the area. A woman involved in the laundering scheme wore a fake belly to transfer money between the restaurants. Letitia must have read this article and figured she would make herself a victim in the story. There was a slight problem, though. The money laundering scheme was broken up in March of 2019. She was just a year late. Honestly, my head is spinning while writing out all of the different stories she told. It's mentally exhausting, so I can't even imagine how everybody in that room felt. And did she really think she could just keep making up all of these stories and then eventually investigators would just be like, oh yeah, that makes sense, and just like let her go? Like what? What did she think was going to happen? No, but her having her notes at the interrogation now make a little more sense. Some of the most damning evidence was revealed during the fourth and final week of the trial. More of the interrogation video was played, and the detective asked Letitia more about the search history found on her cell phone. One was regarding how to get blood out of sheets, and another one said, quote, can blood be spray painted, end quote. We know Gannon's blood was found on particle board. Maybe she was going to try to paint over the stain and then decided to ditch it instead. I don't know. The two most disturbing searches found on Letitia's phone were, quote, blood is spurting from an arterial bleed, end quote. And, quote, I hate my stepson, end quote. Investigators knew these had been typed by Letitia because they contained the same spelling and grammatical errors found in the rest of her lengthy search history. When confronted about the blood on the wall in Gannon's room and why she'd clean it if she didn't do anything wrong, she had an excuse for that, too. Here's a clip of the really strange things she said during this part of the interview. If you had nothing to do with farming Gannon, why would you clean up the blood that's on the wall? Do you, do you, so you're saying you've never had anything happen in your house and you cleaned it up? Never, like... You've never had, like... Why would you the, cut out the carpet? The nosebleed. The carpet? Mm -hmm. Because I was going to get more carpet. It doesn't... The carpet has nothing to do with cutting it out. It's getting smell. It's stunk. I couldn't breathe. None of us could breathe. Did you say that Lena helped you clean up some of the blood on the wall? Lena always helped us clean up everything. Lena helped us clean up the light switch. Lena helped us clean up when Gannon had a nosebleed. Okay. But for this occasion, she helps with that. Now you're going to walk me back through what we've already talked about. So you're now going to go be like, oh, an eight-year-old this and an eight-year-old that. We, there was all the time. Gannon was bleeding all the time. He'd have a nosebleed randomly at the drop of a dime. He'd bite his fingers, bleed all the time. Would it help if I gave you a picture of the wall of what all showed up on it? 
I'm not going to get me to say anything to you because I didn't do anything. Well, what I'm trying to appeal to, though, is, again, you weighing your options right now before we're gone. Sir? Because you're taking a big risk, Letitia. Sir, I believe in higher power. And higher power is going to show the higher world. Oops. And when it does, I would never have to work a day in my life again. And that's going to happen. Guaranteed. Because I did not hurt. I did not dispose, kill, whatever you want to call these things that you're going to name out as verbs. The whole part about Lena being a part of the cleanup is so disturbing. While we can hope this isn't true, considering the kids could never say no to her, it's not implausible to think that she may very well have been involved in the cleaning up of her own brother's murder scene. Also, it's a little ironic that Letitia is speaking about never having to work another day once the truth comes out. I mean, that part is true because, you know, she'll be spending the rest of her life rotting away in prison. Good riddance. Mm, rightfully so. Yeah. Mm. DNA analyst took the stand during week four to talk about the DNA evidence found on multiple items, including Letitia's shoes, a pink suitcase found in the home, carpet brushes, a blanket found in Letitia's car, and much, much more. One of the biggest takeaways from this final week was the testimony from the mental health experts that came in contact with Letitia after her arrest. These experts worked with Letitia during several different time periods over the three years between her arrest and the trial. The first doctor to work with Letitia said the only symptoms she displayed were that of generalized anxiety disorder, but no other personality or symptoms of DID was ever seen. One doctor that worked with Letitia testified that she explained that at the time of Gannon's murder, she had been taken over by one of her other personalities, Maria. Maria was a protector that watched over Lena and Gannon, but Letitia isn't able to access Maria's thoughts and feelings. However, Letitia recalled this Eduardo character who attacked her and said she saw some type of black hooded figure standing on Gannon's bed when she walked past his room. The doctor explained that if Letitia really did have DID, she'd have much more loss of memory or blank periods of time where she couldn't remember specific details. Letitia said that she, or Maria, didn't realize it was Gannon on the bed, but Michael the Archangel. She grabbed a gun from Eduardo and shot the figure. It wasn't until later that Letitia realized it was Gannon. She then supposedly drove around with Gannon's body in her car, trying to find the man that could bring him back to life. At no time does Letitia explain how Gannon's body got from the lake area in Colorado to under a bridge in Florida. The doctor stated that if she really was dissociating, she wouldn't remember these details about what supposedly happened. Also, if this Maria personality really did shoot Gannon, is she also the one who told Harley to get the cleaning products or called to report him missing? The defense focused a lot on this claim that Letitia had either DID or borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder is a mental illness that severely impacts a person's ability to manage their emotions. Disassociative identity disorder is a mental health condition in which a person has multiple distinct personalities. No one in Letitia's life has ever witnessed these other personalities, which is a huge sign that she doesn't have DID. Letitia associated several of her alternate personalities with characters from Twilight and even named one of them 
Jasper. While this does sound ridiculous, there is a component to DID where a person might name their alternate personalities based on characters from books or TV shows because they possess traits deemed helpful. But Twilight? Yeah, Twilight, really? Okay. You know what? We're, we're talking about a very special person here, so... Not questioning anymore. Yeah, no. There's no point. Letitia could very well have some sort of personality disorder, and honestly, she probably does. There's clearly something wrong with her. Yeah. She's obviously narcissistic, at least, you know? But it's hard to diagnose a person with one of these mental health conditions in a short period of time. The doctors who spoke with her were only with her for a matter of hours, when it really takes months to properly diagnose these types of conditions. The defense did a poor job of proving that Letitia had DID and it didn't work in her favor. The expert witness for the defense only met with Letitia for three hours, which is not enough time to determine if she did have DID. We're finally getting into the last week of the trial, thank goodness. This week was all more about the timeline, more text messages, and 6,000 more Google searches. 6,000. Some of these were Spanish girl names, Mm -hmm. multiple searches about face transplants and plastic surgery. Was the bitch going to try to get a face transplant? Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Need a fake ID legit. What to do when they find a body in another state? How long before a body starts to decompose in a bag? Find an immigrant who will admit to a crime. Shock from watching someone get shot. These are a fucking nail in her coffin. 100%. What to do when they find a body in another state? Why would you be searching this if you had nothing to do with the fact that your stepson's body is found in Florida? Find an immigrant who will admit to a crime. How, how fucked up is that? No one, no one is going to admit to a crime they didn't do. Well. No one. I wouldn't say no one. I mean, no one, but. No one in their right mind. No one who knows better. I mean. And while all of this is being said in trial, Letitia was also seen laughing and making heart signs at the defense table, which is completely inappropriate, given why she's there in the first place. These these searches were just like a complete mindfuck to me. This whole case has been. The defense called Dr. Dorothy Lewis to the stand during the last week of trial. Letitia claimed to have sustained multiple concussions in her past, and Dr. Lewis requested for an EEG, MRI, and a neural psych exam to be done before she testified or made a decision about whether or not Letitia had DID. However, these tests were never done, and Dr. Lewis still diagnosed Letitia with DID. The prosecution honestly tore this defense apart. Dr. Lewis stated that the court refused to do the testing. However, the prosecution found an email from Dr. Lewis saying she no longer wanted these tests to be done. Dr. Lewis was confused and forgetful when it came to documentation included in the case and tensions were high. By the time her testimony was all over, all the jury heard was a lot of, I don't know and I'm not sure. It didn't seem like anything Dr. Lewis said did Letitia's defense any sort of favors. Letitia decided not to take the stand. Thank God for small miracles. And the defense rested its case after closing statements on the Friday morning of week four. The jury were sent to deliberate just after 1 p.m. on Friday, May 5th, and it only took them eight hours to reach their verdict. 
The jury found Letitia Stauk guilty on all charges, and she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Judge Gregory Werner addressed Letitia and the court before locking her up for life. Here's an audio clip from his moving but heartbreaking statement. Ms. Stauk, you betrayed the person you loved enough to marry. You told your husband lies and took away someone he loved. You took away every day that Mr. Stauk or Ms. Bullard could have had with their son. When you take a life, regardless of how you do that, you forever alter the future. Neither Mr. Stauk nor Ms. Bullard will ever see their son graduate from high school, go through the joy and the pain of that first love, or get married. They will never know what kind of impact their son may have had on the world if only he had lived to become an adult. And had Gannon's body not been found, they never would have known what happened to Gannon. They would always have had a lingering doubt about what happened to Gannon. And I cannot imagine the pain and sense of loss associated with that. You betrayed your daughter, Harley Hunt. I cannot imagine the emotional impact that you have had on her due to your selfish and calculated actions. This is a young woman that trusted you to put her interests above yours. This is a young woman who believed in you and believed you were innocent of this crime right up until the time that you pled not guilty by reason of insanity. And she still loves you. That's natural for a child, and it doesn't matter how much older they get. You were supposed to protect her. I cannot imagine the guilt she feels or the therapy that she will need to address your portrayal. There is no evidence that she had anything to do with the murder or your cover-up of it. But some people still think that she is somehow involved. She wasn't. The incredible strength of will and courage that it took for her to come in and testify is amazing to me. But she did it because, as she said, it was the right thing to do. And while thankfully she didn't testify, let's not forget about Lena. You betrayed her too. You took her brother from her and forever altered her family dynamics. She will always wonder who she can trust and will always feel that loss. She was there the day you killed Gannon. His body was still in the house when she got back from school. At some point, you even claimed this eight-year-old girl helped you move her brother's body from the basement to the back of your car. That's just simply not true. As she gets older, Lena is going to want to know more, and she's going to want to know if there was something that she could have done to prevent this. I hope she comes to realize that she has no fault in all of this. You betrayed your stepson, and you took his life. You took away everything he was and everything he could ever become. I can't imagine the terror and confusion that he must have felt in the last moments of his life when he knew his life was being taken by someone he trusted to protect it. The way he puts her in her place and talks about all of the people she hurt with her lies and manipulation is priceless. Not only did she take the life of an innocent child, 
She has altered the lives of two other children who will struggle to recover for the rest of their lives. Al and Landon will never see their son grow up, and they will forever be trying to support Lena through that loss. I have chills. It's just... Ugh. At the time of her sentencing, she was being held in the Denver Women's Correctional Facility, but requested placement at San Carlos Prison in Pueblo, Colorado. I'm sure she'll write a long letter about the violation of her rights if her request isn't granted. I personally hope she gets daily threats in her peanut butter and has greasy hair for the rest of her life. I, I don't know about y'all, but we're exhausted from how much our heads have been spinning trying to keep up with all of Letitia's stories and lies. I legitimately have a headache and need to find my ibuprofen mm -hmm. now. And like do some meditation uh, or something. I need, I need my happy flower again and some – um maybe some Matt Rife in my life. Mm. Anyway, what do you think? It's not a question of whether or not she killed her stepson, Gannon, but was she insane? I mean, she is insane, but was she insane? Mm. Or did she scramble to come up with a defense after the fact? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody can tell where we stand when it comes to this case. Mm -hmm. Hopefully Al, Landon, Lena, and Harley are able to eventually find some peace because you know, I mean, and we joke through talking about this stuff because it literally we have to in order to be able to get through it. But mm -hmm. it's not it's not funny. None of I mean, it's not funny. Her stupidity is funny, but what she's done and the impact that she's made on all of these lives, it's, it's not funny. We don't take it lightly. We don't. We're not no. lighthearted about this by any no. stretch of the imagination. And we tell it because his story deserves to be told. Yeah. And, you know, this is a child who lost his life at 11 because of a crazy person who was supposed to be taking care of him. And it's just disgusting. But to read the script, see pictures, and join the community, go to our website, weirdtruecrime.com. We're also on Instagram and TikTok at Weird True Crime. Email us your thoughts about this truly horrific case at weirdtruecrime at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you. We do. And if you're enjoying our creepy corner of chaos, please leave us a five-star rating and review on your podcast app. We'll give you a shout out on a future episode. Come back next week for a very needed What the Fuck Wednesday. Until next time, stay safe and make good choices. Bye! Bye.